Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, we thank the Lord for the opportunity to continue to receive from Him the subject matter of course 313 kingdom culture the lifestyle of saints and as we shared the sermon on the mount is the greatest exposition of kingdom culture in one volume matthew chapter 5 6 and 7 and those who teach otherwise is because they do not understand the kingdom remember we told you the kingdom has three dimensions one is kingdom within the reign of the king in our heart when we are under a sovereign rule number two the kingdom nation everyone who for whom yeshua is not just savior but lord and king and that's the kingdom nation and then the kingdom to come or the manifest kingdom is when he returns to rule over the whole world from jerusalem the city of the great king and for those who enthrone him as Lord and Savior, as we abide in him and him in us, his word in us, and as we look unto him who is meek and lowly, and as we emulate him and refuse to be moved by what we see, Holy Spirit goes to work with the word inside of us to produce a lifestyle absolutely different from the world around us. And that is what kingdom culture is about the lifestyle of the people of the kingdom and brothers and sisters it is important that we continue the study we've done so far matthew chapter 5 we completed it yesterday when we did lesson 9 yesterday was the sermon on the mount as an exposition of kingdom culture and now today we're in lesson 10 the sermon on the mount as exposition of kingdom culture part 3 and we're going to be looking at matthew chapter 6 a father in heaven the great i am who i am have your way and glorify yeshua as holy spirit breaks down the word to grant us understanding Help us, O Lord, not to miss what you are sharing with us. Above all, open our hearts and let your word fall on fertile souls and bring forth a hundredfold. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. And so, here in chapter 6, we, we now go to section E of the Sermon on the Mount. And here he talks about kingdom culture in terms of charitable acts. Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thy arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may, be seen, that they may have glory of men. Very like son to you, they have their reward. But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy arms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So this is about a culture of charitable doing. We're going to bless the poor. We're going to, you know, give to those who do not have. How do we do it? I said, charitable action should be done discreetly. It should be an act of worship and honor to the Lord who is the father of the poor. And we are doing it on his behalf. And we should obey his instruction in caring for them. But we shouldn't do it to attract attention to ourselves, to be hailed by men, to be you know projected as more than we are. So those who do charitable acts as, as acts of public relations and publicity stunts, should not look forward to the Lord to reward them because the applause of men that they receive when they do all those projections is their reward already. And in this generation, it's a message for us that even in use of social media, we should be careful when we begin to talk about, when we show what we are doing in such a way that we be careful. We know that in many cases, we need to prove, especially if you're a 501c or if you're a charity, 
registered, you need to show what you're doing with the funds, but then we need to report with such language, with such humility, that glory goes to the Father, and there's no flaunting of people in order to draw attention to ourselves. When we obey these principles and do it discreetly and reach them and bless people without necessarily making a noise out of it, then the Father who saw what we did in secret, he will reward us openly. He will bring rewards that are beyond what we could have expected. These principles are for obedience. Then the second thing he addresses in Matthew chapter 6 is kingdom culture in prayer. It goes to verse 5. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Very like so unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closest, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, which is in secret that thy Father which is yet in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as a heathen do, for they think they shall be heard, for they are much speaking. Be not therefore like them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Let's look at this second principle of prayer, what we shouldn't do. Here he says, we should not pray like religious hypocrites. They, they love to draw attention to themselves. Inside religious buildings, they won't make noise for people to know they are ready to pray, or in street corners. In other words, they try to publicize what they do, and the reward for them is those attention-grabbing attitudes, those actions, the reward is the applause of men. There's nothing more to expect from the Lord, the reputation of men, and all those who want to draw attention that they are great men of prayer, you know, when they pray, things happen, and they project themselves as such. Then he said, kingdom culture prayer requires a, a deliberate effort to keep our interaction and communion with the Father private. In this way, he will receive such sincere private prayers and reward openly. Again, the same principle he mentioned in the area of almsgiving. Then he said, in kingdom culture prayers, we are communing with our Father. We share with him our heart. We hear from him. We pour out and we hear from him, there's a communion, so there's no room for vain repetition. You know, there are some people that cannot help, they cannot help because they form the habit of just repeating things and their heart is not there. They are doing it out of religious, you know, tradition and they do it and prayer is somehow flat, it's empty and the Lord says, no. Vain repetition, like the prophets of Baal did when they encountered Elijah, encountered them on Mount Carmel, is no use. People making noise and noise and repeating the same phrases. You are not communing with an intelligent father. He said, No, speak with him. So he said, We shouldn't do vain repetitions. And then again, for kingdom citizens, there should be knowledge of the reality that our Heavenly Father. Is all knowing, he knows our needs before we ask him. So, if it is so, and he has made ample provisions, then we should stop making prayer as if something it is not. And that's why the Lord Himself gave us a pattern of prayer. And that's the third thing we can take note of today that He gave us a pattern of prayer. He didn't ask us to repeat those things, those words as words, you know, the Lord's Prayer, and we just begin to mount them. He gave us some principles, some patterns which we will do well to adapt to the things, to how we communicate with Him, the things we cover. He said in verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. Matthew 6, 9. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. After this manner, take this as a pattern. Start with recognizing that he is our Father. Not my Father. Not your Father. He is our Father. And he is in heaven. Our relationship with him should be the basis of our prayer. Because the blood brought us into a relationship with him. We are members of the family of Elohim. Then he said, Hallowed be thy name. Prayer should always have an element of worship, of adoration, of magnifying the holy name of the Lord. Hallowed be thy name. And brothers and sisters, again, there is a revelation here. Hallowed be thy name. What is the name of Elohim? God is not his name. God is a generic term for a supreme being. So, Muslims have God. 
Hindus have God, all religions have God. So the God we have to deal with has a name, and his name is the I am who I am. His name is Yahweh, and there are other names, covenant names of his, Jehovah Shalom, you know, Jehovah Jireh, and all the things. But his name, he said, by this name shall I be known forever. He told Moses, is the I am who I am, and the short form of it is Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, hallowed be thy name. He has our Father as a name. Let's learn to exalt his holy name. Let's do it intentionally. Let's do it knowing what we are doing. Worship should be based on knowing whom we worship. So that we're not like the hidden. Then verse 10, thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here in prayer, we should always also connect our prayer to the kingdom. And what the first thing is, thy kingdom come, let it be in our heart. Is there any area of my life that is not subject to the Father? I bring my heart under subjection to the Father. I enthrone Yeshua in my heart deliberately. And how do we prove it? By letting his will rule my life. His will rule my life. If his rule, his will rules my life, then I am sure that the kingdom is within me. And then, of course, pray for his kingdom to come, that everywhere the sovereign rule of the king will prevail. And, of course, pray also into the return of the king of kings, Yeshua HaMashiach. We should be people who so desire his return because we know that it is the ultimate of our faith. That everything he can do for us on earth is nothing compared with that glorious day. We will see him in glory and we will reign and reign with him and be co heirs with him on planet earth. We need to pray in that kingdom to come. Brothers and sisters, let nobody confuse you. If you are not conscious of the kingdom to come, check up whether you are truly a kingdom citizen. Because everything we do on this earth is a dress rehearsal. We are strangers and pilgrims. How long will we live? 90 years, 100 years, how many get to 100? How many get to 90? The vast majority go before they are 50. The vast majority of people before they are 50, before they are 60. The vast majority go. So if it is so, we are strangers and pilgrims, then the kingdom, we must look beyond even the things he wants to do with us and in us in this time to see that the reality that the king says, I'm going and I'm going to come back. And the day of the trumpet, and when the righteous are taken away and the dead in Yeshua first rise, the king will return to rule and reign in this earth. And we need to be people who are conscious of that need and pray into it. Because what you pray into, your heart connects with it. The day we connect with the reality that our king is returning is going to affect every other thing we do in life. We're not going to clutch at things. We're not going to develop a wicked heart. You know, recently I've been reading through First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles. Just finished Second Chronicles today. You know what, brother? Brothers and sisters, you see human beings. One day they are with the Lord. The next day they are after idols. Human beings are difficult. So, men and brethren, there is a time when all wickedness and all evil shall be rooted out of the earth. And that's when Yeshua will return to restore the kingdom that was lost by Adam and Eve, which is the ultimate of his coming. And that's why his gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. That time when there will be no death, no terrorism, no riot, no confusion, no wars, no plane crashes, no, no nothing about nations fighting against nations because there will be only one king and all of those who he appoints over the earth rim are going to be priests and kings unto him. We need to pray into it. Then he says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the heart of the kingdom prayer. That we come to a place where the will of the Father is the supreme thing that drives everything on earth. Individually, cooperatively, the will of the Father. What shall we do? Career. What shall we do? Choice of school to go to. What shall we do? Choice of, you know, business to get into. What shall we do? Every time of our life, every day, we should be conscious that the will of the Lord is our dwelling place. And therefore, we act like spiritual midwives. Because 
the will of the Lord, when you are praying into it, you are simply a midwife of that will. And the highest prayer is not to force things on Elohim. It is to get to know his will and to be like a midwife for the betting of his will in our circumstance, in our families, in our, the ministries committed to our trust, in everywhere we do. And so we need to take note of that. So we need to pray that the will of God be done. Any prayer meeting that has this is full because that alone was the ultimate of Yeshua. He said, I didn't come from heaven to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me, John chapter 5, verse 30, and John 6, 38, and John 4, 34, he said, my food is to do the will of him that sent me. We need to take the will of the Lord seriously. We need to take our role as midwives of the will of the Lord seriously, which is what true intercession is. Then in verse 11, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. Kingdom citizens, because they believe their Father knows their need before the, the, the need arises, they don't fretch over needs. If you check the whole prayer, pattern of prayer, is just this short verse. Give us this day our daily bread. Why? The Lord doesn't want us to go and project into tomorrow's needs, next tomorrow's needs, next year's needs. No, those things will bring worry and anxiety. Those things will tear us apart and it will represent lack of trust in him. It's like Israel in the wilderness. They needed manna. They needed food. He gave them manna. They needed meat. He gave them quails. And then some people went to, they were told to gather what you need for the day. You and your family. Just what you need. Some people thought they would be wise. They went and gathered beyond what they need. They wanted to gather for tomorrow and next tomorrow. The next day they went, God had consumed them. The Lord said, don't go trying to stack up things for tomorrow. Come to the place where you, your needs are the needs of the day. You're able to talk to your father. He knows your needs before. He's able to answer before you even call. But because he values prayer and he wants us to go into the holy exercise of prayer, he says, come along with me, but approach me in confidence. Give us this day our daily bread. It could be the accommodation you need. It could be the food you need. It could be the job you need. Whatever it is, let it be present need you are presenting to the Father, knowing that he who took care of yesterday is already planned to take care of today and knows tomorrow and has already made provision. He has allocations for assignment. And then, men and brethren, he also come into verse 12 and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, many people have made so much out of this, but the, the, the simplest interpretation is that this one here is talking about debts, as in financial debts, as in you know commercial debts, as in business debts. This one is not forgiveness. That, that one is to come. Here, the Lord is saying, hey, you know what? There's a principle in the kingdom, the principle of jubilee, the principle whereby, you know, of release, where you release whatever people owe. And Yeshua is the Lord of Jubilee and wants us to live a life where if you give somebody a loan and that person cannot repay sincerely, truthfully, you see it, you know it, and Holy Spirit shows you, you can call that brother or sister and write it off. And the day you're able to do it, you discover that you have lifted a heavy burden off that brother and yourself, you have lifted a heavy burden. I remember once, you know, where there were brothers, a brother wanted to marry, a sister was a very good sister of clothes, and they had different issues, and they came, and by the grace of the Lord, I gave what I could to support that marriage, and after some time, they could, the brother couldn't repay, and Whenever he saw me from afar, you could see that he, he was smaller than he ought to be. And he found that this thing was eating him up. So when the Lord showed me the principle of this kind of release, I, when I called the brother, I said, please, I just want you to know that by the grace of the Lord, that money, you know, is written off by the grace of the Lord. You could see the liberation. But interestingly, I was even liberated more because that way he used to feel little was affecting me. I could see that this brother was in chain. Brothers, he says, unchain people where you can. It's a beautiful kingdom principle. That's kingdom culture. 
one of the finest expression of kingdom culture is the ability to excite jubilee to people who cannot repay what they owe you. Then also it comes to another area where it says in verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And this is simply to acknowledge that without the Lord we are toast. Satan would take us and for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. Without the Lord, without His grace, none of us stands on our own. That's what Paul told the people in First Corinthians chapter ten: that let nobody, you know, take heed. Let nobody think he's standing on his own, lest you fall. And here he says, when you go to the Lord in the morning. Talk to the Lord. You know the day. You know your office. You know that Louis fellow trying to make ad advances at you and all kinds of things. Pray that the Lord will deliver you from every evil. That there be no situation where your faith fails, your emotion fails, because you recognize that dying is his kingdom. Dying is the power and the glory. He's able to uphold us. But how many of us are, you know, a lot of Christians walk into danger blindfolded by themselves when we should be able to recognize all the dangers around you know it in your workplace in your business you know it all around you why not talk to the father why not speak to him in confidence and draw strength from him daily and when you draw strength to overcome one you have strength for the second one and the third one you can run an autopilot pilot of his grace but we need to pray into it and that is what the Lord is saying to his people, to be conscious of our need for him. Without him, we can do nothing. Then it comes to another one, verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you forgive not men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive your trespasses. This can as comes to the sins people commit against us. But you know, the word they speak, evil words, negative words, the things they do against us, and they are going to do. Let's come to a place in our walk with the Lord that we realize that human beings have frailties and the frailties can show off in what they do towards us. And let's make up our mind that even before they sin against us, we receive grace not to hold it. That's what Peter said in First Peter 4 verse 8. Have fervent charity amongst yourself, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And here we can receive grace from the Father to forgive people even before they sin against us and forgive them when they sin against us. And when we have that attitude, the same way we extend a mercy to people, Elohim, our Father in heaven, will forgive us by extending mercy to us. And those who refuse to forgive and hold it, you know what? You are condemning yourself to judgment before the Father. This is a principle. There are many people are suffering the effect of lack of forgiveness. Their heart is filled with ought and filled with so much negativity. And they, they don't know it because of a religious spirit. And the Lord is saying, can you know, if people only can pause for a moment and say, Holy Spirit, show me the root of what I'm going through. A lot of people will be surprised where the Lord will show you where unforgiveness has become an issue, become a root. That's why I say we should be careful lest a root of bitterness springing up defile us. A root of bitterness is when, when from unforgiveness to bitterness and then it becomes entrenched in. And that place is a stronghold. And kingdom culture says, let go, forgive people. And in other places, Yeshua, like in Matthew chapter 18, he dealt with this issue of forgiveness. He even gave illustration of the one who was forgiven. And that servant went and saw another servant who owed him a little thing. And he bound the servant and cast him into prison. The master was wrought. I say, so shall it be to every one of you who does not, out of his heart, forgive and let's go. And Peter asked, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Is it seven times? He said, I didn't tell you seven times. Seventy times seven. Ad infinitum. Ad infinitum. That when people forgive, uh, for fail and ask you, forgive them. When they don't ask you, forgive them. There are people, the Lord, if you're a pastor, there are people who will offend and the Lord say, forgive. But the Lord can also show you if they are wolves, he say, keep them outside because of the flock. And such cases is a different principle. You forgive in your heart, but keep the wolf out so that the wolf will not tear up the sheep. And that is a principle. 
and you are doing it out of that principle of guarding the sheep the Lord has given to your heart, and your heart is pure, and there is no negativity there. Then there's kingdom culture in fasting. The Lord also addressed it, and we'll, we'll stop there for today. Uh, here, he said in verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, Matthew 5, 16, Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Very like so unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head with oil, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy heavenly Father which is in secret, and thy Father which yet in secret shall reward thee openly. What is fasting? Fasting is the principle whereby when certain mountains seem to persist and you're praying and you seem to persist, you deny yourself some food or water or both for a season or you deny yourself of solid food and up for like salad up or like water for a season it could be breakfast only it could be breakfast and lunch it could be breakfast lunch and dinner it could be for one day or two or three depending on your capacity if you are pregnant don't fast you are infirm aged or infirm you know sickness don't fast you need to take medication don't fast there are other ways you can deal with the body but generally if you if you healthy and strong the fasting is your you know a kind of abnegation where you deny yourself that so that your whole spirit soul and body can concentrate on the lord and summon the spiritual energy required to deal with that mountain and he says we should avoid doing it as hypocrites who deliberately want you to know they are fasting they won't brush their teeth you know they will just make themselves look fierce and you know this man is fasting mm -hmm. say no don't do it if you do those people who hail you as a man or pray a man who can fast that look at that guy is fasting that mere recognition of you is your reward you have nothing more to expect from the lord but he said, no, no, don't let people know what is going on. Be like no more. Brush your teeth. Have your bath. Put an on it yourself with oil and be no more. And nobody knows what's going on in you. Nobody even knows the meal you are skipping. And, you know, fasting is powerful. In the book of Matthew 17, verse 14 to 22, uh, uh, I mean, from 14 to verse uh, 21, we see the case of the man when Yeshua came down from the mountain of transfiguration, that boy who was, you know, the disciples could not cast out the demon, and then Yeshua began to speak to them. And it's all about faith. If you have faith as a grain of master seed, you can say to this mountain, remove, and it be removed, and nothing shall be impossible to you. But then he added a rider in verse 21 of Matthew 17. How be it, this kind, this type of issue, this type of challenge, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Because in fasting you are saying, Lord, I am not able. And Father, I don't want my flesh to interfere. This time, I don't want food to interfere and bog me down. I want my spirit man and my soul and my body to align before you. And this is something in the body. Even young people can do that. Young people should learn how, you know, certain situations they face, you can deny yourself of at least one meal and deny yourself for a season, a period of time. Deny yourself what works for you and so that you can, don't just deny yourself and then you are not doing anything. It should be fasting and prayer. They go together and faith. They are powerful combination, fasting, prayer and faith. When you excise them, the Lord moves mountain. Now we're going to ask you at this stage, please will you share this video and encourage people to receive these revelations of truth about kingdom culture. The king himself gave it to us so that we will know how to walk in this earth on the narrow way less traveled while others are walking on the broad way and we have him as our father and our king is enthroned in our heart and Holy Spirit has right a way to guide us and lead us and walk out the purpose of the father in our life. We will share it with friends and family and make sure that you can also raise conversations on these your own social media handle within your sphere of influence take the principles raise conversation 
throughout the day, let the earth be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Let's do it. The Lord gives the word. Great is the company that publishes it. Let's publish the truth about kingdom culture. Let's not allow these people who don't know him, the pseudo kingdom movement that does not receive Yeshua as God and takes him as just a prime minister and, you know, just our senior brother only. Yes, in a sense, the father sees us as his sons. And Yeshua in that sense is like senior brother. But if that is all you know of him, you already missed it. Because that is just a manner of speech to show our standing with the Lord as sons of the Elohim. Just like the ultimate son Yeshua. Brothers and sisters, he gave us principles to live by. And he said in John 15, if you love me, obey my commandments. Obedience is a proof of loving him. It's not enough to say I have a relationship, I love him. Where is the proof? His word. When we allow his word to dwell in us richly in our wisdom and dictate everything we think, say, and do, that is the kingdom expressed right there. So, by way of assignment, I'd like to ask you to summarize the key issues he made about, you know, arms giving, charitable acts, about prayer, about, you know, fasting, and everything he has said today, and about debt forgiveness and jubilee. Can you share with us what you receive from them by way of summary? Number two, what would you do as a person? What would you do with this lesson? How would it? How is it going to help you in your journey towards the fullness of the grace of the Father? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because your grace is awesome. Have your way. Glorify Yeshua in all that we think, say, and do. Father, we just ask you to just be glorified. Let this word be a fruit. Let Holy Spirit plant it in the heart of the saints. Every demon assigned to snatch out the truth, we bind and cast out and subdue by the blood that your people, we will be profited with these words manifesting in our lives in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen.